Okay. Um, hello. hello, my name is Jim Brown. I'm going to be talking about uh, rhetorical dissection and tinkering the arcade. But first, I'm supposed to ha say hi to my three-year-old who's watching on the live stream. Hi, Linus. How are you? Um, so I made up this term. Um, well, first, let me start my timer. I know I'm the last thing between you and beer, so I'm not going to take a long time. I made up this term rhetorical dissection. Uh, we'll see if we need it. But first, I want to talk about um, something that probably has happened to all of us. You are working on something, and then you realize that everywhere you turn, that thing uh, appears in front of you, right? So uh, I'm working on this device, this uh, weird Game Boy camera that actually I'm going to send around and let you uh, take, you could take selfies of yourself with this. Um, here, I'll let you pass that around. Um, so I'm working on this device and I hear this NPR story about an app built by astrophysicists that detects cosmic rays. And the way it does that is by using the CMOS chip that is embedded in your camera phone uh, and that, that is able to detect these rays. And in fact, that's the same kind of chip that's sitting in that Game Boy camera that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and the reason I think this is useful to us or interesting is that it demonstrates one of the other possibilities of the hardware within that device, something that uh, Nintendo did not necessarily explore with their version of the Game Boy camera. Um, so as I look at this thing, um, uh, I keep seeing these other possibilities. Around that same time, Casey, so here's the CMOS chip. I'll come back to that. Casey uh, posted this on my wall, which is the smart boy, which I think, from what I gather, started as an April Fool's joke and is now actually possibly going to be a device that you can plug your iPhone 6 into it and turn your iPhone into a Game Boy, a kind of remaking and repurposing of, uh, of the idea of the Game Boy. Um, and this is kind of what we're up to at Rutgers Camden uh, at, in the, the arcade, the Rutgers Camden Archive of Digital Ephemera, which officially launches in a couple of weeks. So I want to talk a little bit about the camera. I want to talk about um, the rhetorician's role in taking apart this kind of device. Uh, and and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think rhetoric offers a, a useful sort of framework for doing this kind of work. So I'm going to do four things. I'm going to talk about this idea of rhetorical dissection as opposed to or perhaps in relationship uh, to what we might call a teardown. Uh, I think they're a little different, and I'll explain why. I'll talk about rhetoric and as possibility, which Annette mentioned. So uh, uh, I guess Annette read my draft, which is like against the rules, I think. Um, the possibilities of the Game Boy camera, the possibilities that others uh, are beginning to imagine by repurposing it and hacking it. And finally, the rhetorician in the arcade. What, what could the rhetorician bring to this project of the archive, uh, the Rutgers Camden Archive of Digital Ephemera? So let's start here. We know these sorts of uh, teardowns on sites like Engadget or iFixit, where we take these things apart, explore their sort of innards, figure out how they work. Um, but I'm mostly interested in the tear and in the sort of uh, approach of the teardown, but with a different set of questions. Uh, the, the Wikipedia entry for the product teardown says uh, that we do this so that others can make use of the information without having to disassemble the product themselves, right? So that I can find out what's inside this thing without taking it apart my $650 uh, phone. But I actually think the experience of taking it apart is really important, sort of part of understanding how this thing um, is put together and how it's made. So actually, uh, I want everyone to sort of have the ability to take these things apart. I think we learn important things from them. So what's the difference between a dissection and a teardown? For one, a dissection might be a little slower than a teardown, which is released immediately, the day after the device comes out, perhaps the day that the device comes out. I'm interested more in questions than answers. This is a rhetorical project rather than, say, a philosophical one that's seeking truth. Uh, if we even want to draw a distinction between those two things. And finally, I'm interested more in invention than critique. So yes, I'm interested in how these components work together, but I'm also interested in how they could be put together in different ways. And that's something that the CFP for this conference noted, right? That perhaps our niche as digital rhetoricians is invention. So I'm gonna draw a little bit on some work in media archeology span here. I'm particularly fond of this article, zombie media, circuit bending media archeology span into an art method. Um, this is uh, uh, Garnett Hertz and UC Perica talking about breaking apart and reverse engineering a device, often without formal expertise. I have zero formal expertise in doing this kind of work. Um, and in this, in this process, what, get, what they say, what gets bent is not only the false image of linear history, which is what media archaeology is all about, right, but also the circuits and the archive itself. What do we learn by bending the circuits and remaking them? 
um, by treating the archive sort of a little bit irreverently. They refer to this disassembly of uh, as depunctualization. So if in actor network theory, we punctualize by sort of black boxing things, sort of creating a self-contained unit. They want to depunctualize, take these things apart, break them, remake them. So when you do that, you might see something like this. Is the sound going to work? I don't, I don't know if I tested this piece. Let's find out. Oh, <laughs> yeah. In a second, you'll hear some weird glitchy sounds. Casey muted us. What do you having in sound? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So just one example of the kind of circuit bending we might do, which we don't normally think of as archival work, right? In fact, sort of perhaps the opposite, taking the archive and messing with it. Um, and, but but uh, the archive I have in mind is something that's not under glass, that is distributed, that is made available for this analytical and creative methodology. Hence the turn to archives in a much broader sense. Uh, that recreation of something can be a different mode of preservation. It's one of the arguments of the arcade. So what does rhetoric have to do with possibility? In my forthcoming book, Ethical Programs, this is the cover image. Um, I kind of like it. It's from the Austin Motel. Or, uh, yeah. Um, so I talk a little bit about the relationship between rhetoric and possibility, particularly with regard to exploits. That is, exploits sort of demonstrate what's possible in a network. Um, and we, we normally think of rhetoric as being in the realm of the probable. So uh, this phrase, ende comenon, pithenon, is often rendered as the available means of persuasion, but could just as easily be rendered as the possible means of persuasion. And, and the piece, and so this is from George Kennedy's translation of Aristotle, we would move, we might move from something like the available means of persuasion to the possible means of persuasion, something much broader and messier and uh, much, much more contingent than the terms available than the term available, or at least a rethinking of what available would mean. The piece that does, that works down this line the most usefully, a piece I cannot really recommend highly enough, is this piece by Megan Foley called Perry T, Interrogating Rhetoric's Domain, in which she argues that by way of sort of returning to and retranslating rhetoric, rhetoric, the function of rhetoric is not persuasion itself, but rather to see the probabilities, the plausibilities, or the persuadabilities. So she says, we're talking about the available, but not available in the sense of an extant substantive object that is already out there, that is there to use, but instead as an imminent and immanent possibility. Rhetoric generates the appearance of actualities out of the underdetermined, not yet actualized domain of an immaterial potentiality. Rhetoric as the possibilities that sort of that are sort of radically open. Rhetorical dissection, as I have in mind, would peel back to the possible means of persuasion from the probable working backwards into what was possible before it was cut off, punctualized. So what are the possibilities of the Game Boy camera? One possibility is to take an album cover uh, photo. This is the cover of Neil Young, Silver and Gold from the year 2000. The cover image of this was taken by his daughter with the Game Boy camera. There's one possibility. Uh, and it's just a fun story that I like to tell. It really doesn't have much to do with what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but how else could we explore the possibilities? We could play with the interface of the Game Boy camera. And we, what we find when we look at the interface is that actually, and some of you are already seeing this as you pass it around, this thing wants you to take a picture of yourself. It's designed for you to take a selfie in 1998. The term doesn't exist yet, but it does want you to take a picture of yourself, not only because of this ball that sits on top and can swivel, and there's a small arrow that tells you which direction to swivel it. We'll talk more about that in a second, but actually through the interface itself. So the video gets sort of contorted here, but um, because of this shift from keynote to PowerPoint. But what's happening there is when you hit shoot, the little eyeball camera faces toward you. When you, sh when you move over to the view, that is to view the images that you've taken, the eyeball shifts away from you. Meaning when you're shooting, you're taking a picture of yourself. When you move to view, camera moves away. So the interface sort of begs you to take pictures of yourself. 
And in fact, the wide angle of the lens begs you to take a picture of yourself. It's really literally made for selfies. Um, the other thing you can do is make uh, music with this thing. So I composed this music for you. And you can't really see that, but the, the head of that DJ is a pumpkin, is like a jack-o'-lantern. And we can play with this sort of error, weird error screens that come up too, things like that are strangely racialized in very odd ways that say, that, that sort of pop up at, at weird moments. We don't really know when they're going to pop up that say, well, what are you running from? It's not clear you know, exactly why this Game Boy does this and people have speculated. Or we could take it apart, which is what I did. And, and this is the early stage of this research, but I wanna share with you some of what I learned when I took it apart. The first thing I learned is that Nintendo doesn't want me to take it apart. These tri-wing screws are a pain to get out. Although, luckily, we have somebody that now, a, a, a company called Kitchbent that sells a tri-wing screwdriver. So that red screwdriver on the bottom is actually designed to get those screws out. Interestingly, once you get inside the device, I'll skip ahead here for a second, you see just regular old Phillips head screwdrivers. So it's sort of a half-hearted, half-assed attempt by Nintendo to keep us out, right? Once we get past the tri-wing screws, we just have regular old Phillips head screws. We get inside, so, so here's that eyeball camera we looked at with the, the arrow that tells us which way to point. Um, and when we get inside, we see things like the cartridge with a battery so that you can save photos. We see uh, the ROM cartridge itself, the RAM. Um, and we see these cables that run. Um, this is why the camera doesn't turn 360 degrees because otherwise those cables would twist and break. So there's a small little piece of plastic that keeps you from turning it the whole way around. Here's what the lens looks like. Uh, the, the person I've been working with on this project, Robert Emmons, the associate uh, director of the Digital Study Center, he and I had some, uh, some fun with this component. We took it apart. There are some th there's a sort of threaded screw there. We can take the, uh, the lens apart and actually create a manual focus lens if you really sort of uh, play with it a little bit. Uh, the, 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 and in, again, not, something, not an option that Nintendo gave you. Um, again, we found, a lot, found out a lot about this CMOS chip, which was sort of uh, a bit, you know, a bit cutting edge in 1998. Uh, most cameras at this point had CCD chips, which uh, take more battery power. What a CMOS chip does is process and take images in the same step. Um, so that ends up saving a good bit of battery power. But we were also able to uh, find documentation for this chip, it's for uh, the Mitsubishi documentation. We've, we've been investigating this a little bit. A lot of people have taken this camera and wired it into Arduinos. In fact, I think I have an image of that here coming up in a second. So there's a lot of things you can do with this. Um, here again is that cable that runs from the cartridge out to the camera. And if we actually just take that cable out, remember the only reason that cable exists is so you can take pictures of yourself, right? We could just have the camera facing outward, have a very much, a much smaller mechanism. It would look something like this. This is just the CMOS chip mounted right onto the ROM uh, cartridge, onto the Game Boy cartridge. Um, and we would have a much smaller, smaller mechanism than the one that you're passing around the room. And of course, we could hack this in other ways too, by way of like a hex editor that tells us, you know, here's a, up here at where it says F1 race, that's the name of the game that's uh, being sort of hacked in this hex editor. And this is something we're just now starting to get into and we will be in our launch event in a couple of weeks with Patrick Lemieux at Duke University. Um, speaking of Patrick, he created this this morning. Uh, a video, a, a game on the Game Boy that we shipped to him that says, Hi, Jim Brown. Doesn't do a whole lot yet, but that is an actual Game Boy game that has been recreated, right? And we're going to do some things with games and the camera itself. Here's what it looks like from the back. Nintendo doesn't want you to do any of this. In fact, there was a story that came out just recently in, uh, I think it was IGN, about how game companies consider this to be plagiarism. I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me, but we're going to keep doing it. So the rhetorician in the arcade, what's the role of digital rhetoric in something like the arcade? Um, what is it that we're doing that I think the people in this room, I'll go back to that. It's not really the official logo yet, but I think it's pretty enough for the time being. Um, and I think part of the idea here is that we're interested in this sort of, if we're interested in this broader notion of rhetoric as the possible, then I think the rhetorician is interested in the possible means of persuasion that again, have not previously been explored or has been explored in other disciplines like media archaeology. Um, but the, the, the archive of digital ephemera need not be very old stuff. 
I see knowing nods from a couple of people in the audience. This device is called Bird Cloud. It was supposed to be a device that I was that me and Kevin, where are you? Over there. Me and Kevin Brock and Casey Boyle and David Reeder were going to use for a C's project we were working on. And about what three months after we all purchased it and started to think about how we might use it, uh, the funding went. Uh, yeah, the company went belly up. The funding fell through. And now this thing is part of the archive of digital ephemera. And it was only really in existence for a very short time. But I'd be very interested in having someone do a study of, of bird cloud, not just the sort of economics of, of the, the sort of capital investment that fell through, but what could this thing have been? What, what were they sort of setting up? What might we have been able to make with it? That's, inter that's an interesting challenge because, of course, we don't have the software that they were sort of going to be supporting. This project links up with things like platform studies, right? So it doesn't have to be only hardware either. It could be software as well. This book I, I highly recommend. I taught it this semester, and it's a really great historical account of Flash, which is supposedly dying, right? Um, or we might remake things like this. This is a, the Game Boy camera gun that, when you hit the trigger, takes a picture of someone and then uses the Game Boy printer, which is right here. I have one of these, too, so I'll let you print out those pictures you took. Um, they barely look like a picture. Uh, but again, we, we see these as all viable approaches to the arcade and to arcade projects. Now, this, I'm going to close here by talking a little bit about the CFP for this event. It gave us a few possibilities of what we might do. We might, in this room and, and over this weekend, we might decide that re, uh, how to distinguish rhetoric from the digital humanities. That was one possibility. We might d determine or develop some emerging communicative practices. Or we might develop new humanities curricula, new, new sort of pedagogical approaches. It might not be a, a huge surprise to those uh, to many in this room that I think that this first option is one we should not really take on. I think it's a, it's a cul-de-sac and I think it's a sort of fighting of old battles between literature and rhetoric and composition. I'll leave it at that and, and let you all ask me questions at, at the Q&A or we can just leave it lie and not talk about it. But I, I think I think we should sort of avoid this line of inquiry altogether. I think it's a distraction. It keeps us from doing the actual interesting work. But I do think the arcade could, could really have interesting implications for both of these other possibilities of emerging communicative practices and developing humanities curricula. Imagine a humanities classroom in which people are sort of taking these devices apart and remaking them uh, from rhetorical perspective, from an art history perspective, from lots of different humanities perspectives. Again, the focus here is on invention and remaking. So the dis dissection is the first step toward a new possibility, a, a reimagined possibility. Um, and, and that's really where I'd like to stop here and sort of invite you all um, to help us sort of hack and reimagine these devices. Uh, uh, we'll have this event surrounding the, the Game Boy camera here in a couple of weeks. And after that, we'll have some more uh, information out about how you might all uh, get involved. And I'm going to leave this up as sort of shameless plug for the Digital Studies Center at Rutgers Camden. But thank you very much.